Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 209. Today's big Bible question, how can a genuinely godly person be depressed? I thought Christians were supposed to be joyful and all. So hello friends, welcome to another Friday. The weekend is upon us, the pandemic has not abated, but God is still on his throne sovereignly directing the affairs of humanity, working all things together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Take a deep breath, relax into his hands and into his plan. In this world, we will have tribulation, but take heart, says Jesus. He has overcome the world. Today's Bible passages are Judges chapter 7, Acts 11, Jeremiah 20, and Matthew chapter 6. Our focus passage today goes back to the book of Jeremiah. And though this episode might seem to be a downer on the surface, I'd like to tell you that it's not. There is hope here and an authentic and unvarnished look at what the Word of God teaches about despair, sadness, and depression. At the beginning of Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah is beaten under the orders of the sunshine-pumping false prophet Pashur. Jeremiah does not rejoice at this beating, but in frustration composes a heart-rending lament that ends with a question. Why did I come out of the womb to see only struggle and sorrow to end my life in shame? So it's not the most encouraging Bible passage that we're about to read, but trust me, there is encouragement in the Word of God for us today. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 1, Pashur the priest, the son of Immer, and chief official in the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, so Pashur had the prophet Jeremiah beaten and put him in the stocks at the upper Benjamin gate in the Lord's temple. The next day, when Pashur released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord does not call you Pashur, but terror is on every side, or the Hebrew word Magor Misabib. For this is what the Lord says, I am about to make you a terror to both yourself and those you love, They will fall by the sword of their enemies before your very eyes. I will hand Judah over to the king of Babylon, and he will deport them to Babylon and put them to the sword. I will give away all the wealth of this city, all its products and valuables. Indeed, I will hand all the treasures of the kings of Judah over to their enemies. They will plunder them, seize them, and carry them off to Babylon. As for you, Pashur, and all who live in your house, you will go into captivity, you will go to Babylon, there you will die." And there you will be buried, you and all your friends to whom you prophesied lies. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You seized me and prevailed. I am a laughingstock all the time. Everyone ridicules me. For whenever I speak out, I cry out. I proclaim violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has become my constant disgrace and derision. I say I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name, But his message becomes a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in, and I cannot prevail. For I've heard the gossip of many people. Terror is on every side. Report him. Let's report him. Everyone I trusted watches for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived so that we might prevail against him and take our vengeance on him. But the Lord is with me like a violent warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. Since they have not succeeded, they will be utterly shamed. An everlasting humiliation that will never be forgotten. Lord of armies testing the righteous and seeing the heart and mind. Let me see your vengeance on them, for I have presented my case to you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he rescues the life of the needy from evil people. May the day I was born be cursed. May the day my mother bore me never be blessed. May the man be cursed who brought the news to my father, saying, A male child is born to you bringing him great joy. Let that man be like the cities the Lord demolished without compassion. Let him hear an outcry in the morning and a war cry at noontime because he didn't kill me in the womb so that my mother might have been my grave, her womb eternally pregnant. Why did I come out of the womb to see only struggle and sorrow to end my life in shame. Now, friends, I should be honest with you. That is a gut-wrenching passage. It is as authentic and genuine as it gets. And I'm almost uh, not embarrassed to read it to you, but it's just, it's just, sh- it shakes you to read such things. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't have any patience 
for somebody who sort of has this view of the Bible that it's like a sunshining, pumping book with just a bunch of positive slogans and sayings and things like that in it. it. You know, people that have that kind of view of the Bible have never actually read through it and seen scenes like this where the people of God get to the lowest levels of despair. So this passage in Jeremiah 20, many others like it in the Bible, demonstrate beyond any shadow of a doubt that a faithful follower of God can experience deep despair or be depressed. Now, we've discussed this issue in some depth before on this podcast on episode 123, Can Christians Be Depressed? I think it's a worthy topic to bring up again, though, today because, well, it's part of Jeremiah 20. And also, I think the world right now is just seeing an unprecedented, in my lifetime, level of depression, both in the church and outside of the church. Now, if you think, well, Christians shouldn't be depressed, Christians can't be depressed, I'll refer you back to episode 123, but I'll also refer you to Brother Charles Spurgeon, a spiritual giant, if there ever was one. He said this, I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. And you know what? Spurgeon isn't the only one. Jeremiah experienced these depressions of spirit, as did Elijah, Moses, Paul, David the psalmist, Job, Solomon, Ezekiel, Hannah the intercessor, and many other mighty men and women of God in the Word of God. Some wrestled occasionally with depression, some regularly, but I see nothing in the Bible that indicates that a Christian should expect a life free of trouble, tribulation, despair, or depression even. And yes, I'm fully aware of of the great command of the apostle in Philippians 4.4, 4, where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I say yes and amen. Don't worry about anything. Rejoice in the Lord always. But I would point out, that the same guy that penned that commandment under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit also wrote First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians one, seven through nine under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, where he says, We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. The same Nehemiah who said, The joy of the Lord is our strength, also wrote, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So, can a Christian be depressed and wrestle with despair? Absolutely, you bet. So I want to give you three truths to rejoice in if you are in that place right now. You're a follower of Jesus. You're struggling right now, be it with despair or depression or anxiety or whatever. I want to give you three truths to rejoice in. And notice, I'm not saying that these are cures for depression. That's a complicated issue, and I'm not promising something like that. But I am saying there is hope in the Word of God for all of you who are going through the valley of the shadow of death, who are going through depression and despair, uh, whether it's pandemic related or what, I don't know, but there is some truth to rejoice in, and I want to look at it. And truth number one, Jesus came to bring good news to the broken hearted. I don't know what else broken hearted can mean, but despairing, depressing, whatever. In his first sermon, Jesus, first sermon, keep in mind, this is the first public thing that he says in a ministry context that we know about. His first sermon, he unrolls the scroll of Isaiah, reads Isaiah 61, and then says that he himself has come to fulfill that scripture in Isaiah 61. So know this, at some point in the future, the near future, the middle future, or the far away future, the Son of God will come and wipe away every tear from your eye, and sadness will be no more, because he is coming with healing in his wings. He may heal you now, he may heal you very soon, or his healing may tarry until he returns. But those crying now will not cry long, and will not cry forever, because this 
is the first sermon of Jesus from Isaiah 61 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, Jesus, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. And you better believe that Jesus is going to fulfill that mission to the uttermost. Truth number two to rejoice in. Our Heavenly Father has a particular love and affinity for the brokenhearted. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Now, we're also told in the Psalms and in the Word of God that God is far away from the prideful and the haughty, but He dwells in close proximity to those who are brokenhearted. It draws Him. Psalm 147, 3 through 6 says, He, God, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the numbers of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Our Lord is great, vast in power. His understanding is infinite. Yea, he's big, huge, amazing. But verse 6, the Lord helps the afflicted. God is mighty. He's great. He's vast. He created everything with a word, but he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up the wounded. He is close to the afflicted and he helps them. Truth number three to rejoice in. Real and lasting peace will always come from Jesus. We may not always perceive it well. That's not the fault of Jesus or the peace he sends, but our senses are so often dulled by our sin, by our humanity, by our sorrow, by the world, and by our tribulations. But that does not mean that he has not given us his peace and left it with us. John sixteen thirty three says, I have told you the, these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Now, lest you think I am giving you a hollow, fake, and untested hope here, I want to give you a quote from William Gucker. Mr. Gucker says, Listen to how he, Jesus, leads us into happiness. It's not pie in the sky, philosophical, merely spiritual happiness. It's actual, tangible, real happiness based on real promises, based on real acts and things that happened in history. Now, you might be asking, who is William J. Gucker? Why should we listen to him? Well, that's a great question. Well, I found Mr. Gucker on YouTube last year through a beautiful comment he made on a worship song. Now, if you've ever been to YouTube, most of the comments on YouTube just show off the worst of humanity. But I was moved by Mr. Gucker's comment when he wrote, I'm married 18 years and I have seven children, brain cancer, looking to die well and leave my kids with the same joy that I've found in Christ. This song captures exactly what I want them to know. Thank you. Now, I am sad, not for him, but for us to report that St. Gucker left the earth last year. But when he wrote the above about happiness in Jesus, he knew he had brain cancer and he knew he was dying and he was going to be leaving his wife and seven kids. This is a man who is facing a most terrifying reality. So when he talks about the happiness of Jesus, we should listen and snap to attention. And I want to read his quote again. He says, listen to how he, Jesus, leads us into happiness. It's not pie in the sky, philosophical, merely spiritual happiness. It's actual, tangible, real happiness based on real promises, based on real acts and things that happen in history. Now, I don't want to minimize depression in the least. Sometimes medicine is necessary for depression, and that's not a sin. But sometimes, as Spurgeon will tell us in a moment, the best efforts of both doctors and ministers will fall short of taming the dark beast of depression. And divine rescue is our only hope. And thanks be to God that it is a sure and certain hope. Deliverance will come now. It will come soon, or it will come in a while. But deliverance will indeed come for all who are in Christ. And I want to say this to you. Some of you have had terrible sorrows in your life. You've lost dear loved ones and it has broken your heart and nearly broken your life. But I want to tell you what I just read again. Hope and deliverance will come now, it will come soon, or it will come in a while. 
but it's coming. It is coming because Jesus is coming back to wipe every tear. That passage might just mean some of us will be weeping into eternity, but none of us will be weeping forever. The vast majority of our lives, 99.999999% plus, will be spent in the presence of Jesus with healed hearts. Those of us who are grieving for a lifetime, I'm not minimizing that grief, but I'm telling you, when Jesus returns, there will be healing in his wings. He will wipe away every tear, and you will spend an eternity with a healed heart, a restored heart, a heart that knows no grief. And I hope that, that those words don't make you rejoice, but the reality of what's behind those words make you rejoice, because it's bedrock truth. Now here, let's cl close with Spurgeon. He writes this, when troubles multiply and discouragements follow each other in long succession, like Job's messengers, then too, amid the disturbance of soul occasioned by evil tidings, despondency robs the heart of all its peace. Constant dripping wears away stones, and the bravest minds feel the fret of repeated afflictions. If a scanty cupboard is rendered a severer trial by the sickness of a wife or the loss of a child, and if ungenerous remarks of hearers are followed by the opposition of deacons and the coolness of members, then like Jacob, we are apt to cry, all these things are against me. When David returned to Ziklag and found the city burned, goods stolen, wives carried off, and his troops ready to stone him, we read, he encouraged himself in his God, and well was it for him that he could do so, for he would have then fainted if he had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Accumulated distresses increase each other's weight. They play into each other's hands and, like bands of robbers, ruthlessly destroy our comfort. Wave upon wave is severe work for the strongest swimmer. The place where two seas meet strains the most seaworthy boat. If there were a regulated pause between the buffetings of adversity, the spirit would stand prepared, but when they come suddenly and heavily, like the battering of great hailstones, the pilgrim may well be amazed and overwhelmed. The last ounce breaks the camel's back, and when that last ounce is laid upon us, what wonder if we for a while are ready to give up the ghost. This evil will also come upon us, we know not why, and then it is all the more difficult to drive it away. Causeless depression is not to be reasoned with, nor can David's harp charm it away by sweet discoursings. We might as well fight with the mist as with this shapeless, undefinable, yet all-beclouding hopelessness. One affords himself no pity when in this case, because it seems so unreasonable and even sinful to be troubled without manifest cause, and yet troubled the man is, even in the very depths of his spirit. If those who laugh at such melancholy and depression did but feel the grief of it for one hour, their laughter would be sobered into compassion. Resolution might perhaps shake it off, but where are we to find the resolution when the whole man is unstrung? The physician and the man of God may ununite their skill in such cases, and both their hands full and more their more than full. The iron bolt, which so mysteriously fastens the door of hope and holds our spirits in gloomy prison, needs a heavenly hand to push it back. And when that hand is seen, we cry with the apostle, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That's Second Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. It is the God of all consolation who can, with sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse our poor chests of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Simon sinks till Jesus takes him by the hand. The devil within rends and tears the poor child till the word of authority commands him to come out of him. When we are ridden with horrible fears and weighed down with an intolerable incubus, we need but the sun of righteousness to rise and the evils generated of our darkness are driven away. But nothing short of this will chase away the nightmare of the soul. Amen. 
Uh, friends, I, I would like to um, extend an invitation to you, which I believe is the first time in all uh, 209 episodes of this podcast to do this. I would be honored and privileged and happy to pray for you if you are going through great times of anxiety or depression or despair or hurting right now. And if you would like me to pray for you, please understand that there's no particular power in my prayer. Uh, it's not prayer that is powerful. It is the God who answers prayer that is powerful. But again, it would be my privilege to pray for you, and I will pray for you, Lord willing. Um, I, I wish to do that. So if you would like to leave a comment at BibleReadingPodcast.com, if you would like to send me a um, email. My email is chaseathompson at gmail.com. Heck, if you want to text me, I'm not going to put my text number or my phone number on uh, the BibleReadingPodcast.com page because that seems like a bad idea, but I'll tell you my number. It's area code 205. Remember, I'm from Alabama. Area code 205-568- 6836. I'll say it again. Operators aren't standing by, but I would be happy to hear from you and pray for you. 205-568-6836. I'm a night owl, so you can text me anytime, day or night. I usually silence my phone when I go to sleep, so it doesn't matter what time it is. Um, I would be happy to pray for you. Just, if you would, leave me your first name and where you're from. That's all I need. Uh, and whatever request you want, 205-568-6836, or you can email me or leave a comment on the blog, whatever. I'm just, if you're going through despair, depression, anxiety, or whatever, I would be joyful to pray for you. Um, and if not, then rejoice in the Lord always and um, pass on his encouragement to those who might be going through a darker time. Let's keep reading in the scripture with Judges chapter 7, verse 1. Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the troops who were with him got up early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them, below the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many troops for me to hand the Midianites over to them, or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, I saved myself. Now announce to the troops, whoever is fearful and trembling may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the troops turned back, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many troops. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. If I say to you, This one can go with you, he can go. But if I say about anyone, This one cannot go with you, he cannot go. So he brought the troops down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Separate everyone who laps water with his tongue like a dog. Do the same with everyone who kneels to drink. The number of those who lapped with their hands to their mouths was three hundred men, and all of the rest of the troops knelt to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the three hundred men who lapped and hand the Midianites over to you, but everyone else is to go home. So Gideon sent all the Israelites to their tents, but kept 300 troops who took the provisions and their ram's horns. The camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That night the Lord said to him, Get up and attack the camp, for I have handed it over to you. But if you are afraid to attack the camp, go down with Pura, your servant. Listen to what they say, and then you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the troops who were in the camp. Now the Midianites, Amalekites, and all the people of the east had settled down in the valley like a swarm of locusts, and their camels were as innumerable as the sand on the seashore. When Gideon arrived, there was a man telling his friend about a dream, and he said, Listen, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, struck a tent, and it fell. The loaf turned the tent upside down so that it collapsed. His friend answered, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has handed the entire Midianite camp over to him. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to Israel's camp and said, Get up! For the Lord has handed the Midianite camp over to you. Then he divided the three hundred men into three companies and gave each of the men a ram's horn in one hand and an empty pitcher with a torch inside it for the other hand. Watch me, he said to them, and do what I do. When I come to you at the outpost of the camp, do as I do. 
When I and everyone with me blow our ram's horns, you are also to blow your ram's horn all around the camp. Then you will say, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men who were with him went to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch after the sentries had been stationed. They blew their ram's horns and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. The three companies blew their ram's horns and shattered their pitchers. They held their torches in their left hands and their ram's horns to blow in their right hands, and they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! Each Israelite took his position around the camp, and the entire Midianite army began to run, and they cried out as they fled. When Gideon's men blew their three hundred ram's horns, the Lord caused the men and the whole army to turn on each other with their swords. They fled to Acacia House in the direction of Zerah, as far as the border of abel Mehola near Tabath. Then the men of Israel were called from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim with this message, Come down to intercept the Midianites and take control of the water courses ahead of them as far as beth Barah and the Jordan. So the men of Jordan were called out, and they took control of the water courses as far as beth Barah and the Jordan. They captured Oreb and Zeb, the two princes of Midian. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the wine press of Zeb while they were pursuing the Midianites. They brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. Acts chapter 11. The apostles and the brothers and sisters who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. When J- Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began to explain to them step by step, I was in the town of Joppa praying, and I saw in a trance an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners from heaven, and it came to me. When I looked closely and considered it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the birds of the sky. I also heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, I said, for nothing impure or ritually unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice answered from heaven a second time, What God has made clean you must not call impure. Now this happened three times, and everything was drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to accompany them with no doubts at all. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we went into the man's house. He reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He will speak a message to you by which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as on us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? When they heard this, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, "Uh, So then, God has given repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks, also proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarshish to search for Paul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. They did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. Mark chapter 6 verse 1. 
He left there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom that has been given to him, and how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters even here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the road except a staff, no bread, no traveling bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on an extra shirt. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you, when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil, and healed them. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and... That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. Still others said, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. When Herod heard about it, he said, "Mm, John, the one I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he married her. John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias held a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing he was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. An opportune time came on his birthday when Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. When Herodias' own daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. He promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went and said to her mother, What should I ask for? John the Baptist's head, she said. At once she hurried to the king and said, I want you to give me... John the Baptist's head on a platter immediately. Although the king was deeply distressed because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about it, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they went away in a boat by themselves to a remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted and it's already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You give them something to eat, he responded. They said to him, Should we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, "Mm, Five and one, two fish. Then he instructed them to have all the people sit in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up twelve baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were five thousand men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of them to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. 
After he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. Well into the night, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Very early in the morning, he came toward them walking on the sea and wanted to pass them. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke with them and said, Have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. When they crossed over, they came to the shore at Gennesaret and anchored there. As they got out of the boat, immediately people recognized him. They hurried throughout that region and began to carry the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, into villages, towns, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the end of his robe. And everyone who touched it was healed. Thanks be to God. Friends, may the word of God encourage you. May his spirit bless you and fill you and point you to the son, the author and finisher and perfecter of our salvation. Good day and Godspeed.